This is Garrett Ballinger, the Executive Director of the Cardinal Institute for West Virginia Policy. I am with two experts today to talk about an issue that's really been discussed quite a bit this legislative session. Uh, of course, I'm talking about education and education reform. So to my furthest right is Vicki Alger, PhD, with the Independent Women's Forum. Welcome, Vicki. Thank you. And then to my immediate right is Rochelle Ingen with us from the Institute for Justice. Um, also a policy expert and so we're going to pepper them over the next few minutes with a bunch of questions about what is school choice what does that mean how can it benefit West Virginia what are some of the myths that are surrounding school choice and so hopefully we'll answer some questions here and uh, we'll have a good idea moving forward of how uh, school choice can benefit West Virginia so let me start with you Vicki when you hear school choice or when somebody hears school choice what exactly does that mean well when we break school choice down to its most basic element. It's an aspect of parental rights that parents get to choose not just where their children are educated, but how they're educated. So what's important about school choice is that we move the debate away from where children are educated to whether they're educated. Mm -hmm. So that's great. So if you guys didn't hear that, so Vicki was saying school choice is fundamentally about it's not whether your kids or where your kids are being educated, it's whether they get educated. And that's something that's been debated quite a bit here. Um, we know in West Virginia, our public school system is not really doing the job that we're asking of it. Um, and so this is an idea of how do we fix that issue? So that to me seems pretty non-controversial, Vicki. So I I'm curious, what does a lot of the controversy surrounding school choice, where does that come from? And, and you know, how should we face that? I think what it comes from is from the parent side, I don't want to, we can get into the politics later, but I think fundamentally from the parent side, it's new and will this hurt my child? And I'm here to tell you, we could talk about the mountains of evidence that are it's growing every day that it's good and it's positive across all sorts of factors. But as a stepmom with four stepsons who went, who were in public school, district public schools, I love it when more, there are more school choice options. I'm in Arizona, we've got every option imaginable. And schools are better today than they were when I was in school generations ago. So school choice is a tie that lifts all boats. All education options get better. So if you're afraid of the impact about to your child, don't be. It's, it's going to get even better and better the more options you and other parents have. Oh, that's great. So, Rochelle, she had mentioned that Arizona is sort of a rich jungle, if you will, <laughs> compared to the barren desert of school choice that West Virginia has. So would you mind maybe going into a little bit more of the specifics about what types of school choice options are available and what can a state like West Virginia, uh, how can it benefit from having some of those choice options? Yeah, definitely. Well, most importantly, I think it's we should mention that 26 states and the District of Columbia have private school choice programs. So I'll give a little difference between public and private school choice. When we're talking about public school choice, we're talking about things like public charter schools and the ability for a child to move in between districts, otherwise called inter or intra-district transfer. What we at IJ specialize in is private school choice. So there are three forms of private school choice. The first is a scholarship or a voucher as they're sometimes called. And the way this works is that the child is given money or a scholarship to go to a private school. So they are leaving their public school and going to a private school. The second, and this is you know the newer type of private school choice, is an education savings account. And an education savings account operates almost like an education debit card. Students receive funds into an account and then they can use those funds on a vast array of educational services. Um, so you're not necessarily in a school building, you're being educated in a way that you can truly customize to best fit your needs. And you can use these funds on a variety of different things, things like private school tuition, textbooks, online learning. Um, if you're a high school student and you want to go take a class at a community college, you can use the funds on that and you can use the funds on technology. And then the third type of private school choice is an individual tax credit or deduction. And a lot of states offer these for things like textbooks or tuition or whatnot. But I think the most important thing to address is that 
a lot of people already have school choice, if you think about it. Those can, who can afford it are able to exercise their school choice. They can move to a district that has a really good public school. They can pay to send their children to a private school. We see this every day across the country. What these private school choice programs do is they give that option to everyone, not just those who can afford it. Oh, that's great. And I think it's important for people out there that are watching this to understand is I believe every neighboring state for West Virginia now has some form of private school choice um, or a choice, generally speaking. So West Virginia, again, is a little bit late to the party on some of these issues. Vicki, when you look at all those different options, you have ESAs and charter schools and open enrollment and tax credit scholarships and vouchers and all that sort of thing. If you had to pick something to give West Virginia that would help benefit our, our students and our families the most. Which one of those do you think you'd go with and why? Hands down, it would have to be education savings accounts. They are truly the latest advance because they empower parents to unprecedented levels. So with scholarships, which are fantastic, I would never say uh, anything other than a scholarship. It's a lifeline for, for parents. Um, but ESAs expand it beyond the choice of this school or that school. It's now, what sort of education do, it, do I think, as my child's parent, think is best for my child? So special education therapies, you have a whole array. Uh, curriculum, you have a whole array. Or if you don't find something that exactly meets your needs, I'm going to homeschool or try a different combination. What was so terrific about Arizona when we first started it for families uh, with special needs children is that parents, their eyes were open, their children are flourishing, they actually had money left over. Now keep in mind, I believe at the time it was only 90% mm -hmm. of state funding and parents had money left over because parents went out, they found the best options at the best prices and they were thinking ahead because the money rolls over, unused funds roll over from one year to the next for future education expenses, including college under most programs. So it's a win-win for everybody and our program has had, in Arizona has had an unprecedented 100% parental satisfaction rate. Where do you ever hear of that happening? Well, that's awesome. And you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Arizona was the nation's first ESA program, correct, in 2011. So it's not like these have been around forever, but it is sort of the, the latest innovation, right? And for education, it's an innovation. I mean, we've all had health savings accounts before. In the military, I know my husband talked about having uh, dedicated use credit cards. So when you travel, you have your credit card. It makes it much easier. And so you pay hotel, rental car, if you pick up a flat screen TV, however, you're not gonna get that. <laughs> but the concept has been around a long time, but for some reason, our, our, our education system, the way we largely do it at Sound Lake, West Virginia, is impervious to innovation. Those walls are starting to break down, and I think it's really exciting. Oh, that's very exciting. So I'm sure, not to get overly technical, but it sounds like, so the state will send you a credit card or a debit card, mm -hmm. Right, with some sort of predetermined uh, percentage of funding from the state, is that correct? So mm -hmm. let's just say that West Virginia's state portion that it spends on kids is $10,000. So if we would have an e and that's much higher than what it actually is. But let's say if we had an ESA, they'd get 9,000 of that or 7,500 mm -hmm. or just kind of whatever we determine as a, as a state it should be, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so <clears throat> you get that portion of that funding and then you can use it however you want. And and one really unique thing about ESAs, and, and I come from very rural Missouri and could have really benefited from an ESA. I didn't have any private schools close to me, but I could have you know, purchased homeschool materials. I could have purchased online learning. And West Virginia is you know, largely rural, so it'll really benefit those kids that are in areas where there aren't a lot of private schools and there aren't a lot of options besides that single public school. And it'll give them the ability to have this world-class education that they can customize to their needs in a place where there might not be a lot of options otherwise. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, so you had said something, you know, you had sort of joked that, you know, you can't get the flat screen TV on this, right? And so like naturally that's one of the first questions that I think proponents of ESAs get was, well, how do we stop fraud, right? How do we stop uh, 
the parents that just go out and they blow it at the racetrack or they go to Best Buy and they buy a new TV and sound system, <laughs> right? So surely in the six or seven other states that have ESAs, there's some sort of anti-fraud monitoring system. Can you just talk a little bit about what that means and what that looks like? Absolutely, and I'd like to set it up with a comparison. Unlike traditional public school funding now, which you're funded based on prior year, and it's very opaque, maybe five people in a given state if you're lucky, actually understand how schools are, are really, really funded. <laughs> mm -hmm. So unfortunately, that sort of murkiness lends itself to fraud and abuse. So think of in the past year how many stories there may have been about money going missing or misappropriated or just absconded with. Mm -hmm. And we find out about it years and years later and that money's never coming back. Contrast that with an ESA, which is in real time and money is dispersed quarterly. So let's just say it's a special needs child and that child is getting $12,000 in total. You're only getting $3,000 per quarter but before you get your next quarterly disbursement, you have to complete expense reports with receipts that go through independent verification to make sure it's accurate. And then the whole program is randomly audited mm -hmm. by an independent third party. I would love to say that in Arizona we're perfect angels and we wouldn't possibly do anything wrong, <laughs> but we do catch some honest mistakes and yes, some fraud. But I want you to I couldn't believe how low this fraud rate was. The goal is always zero. It's less than one half of 1%. Oh, wow. Because it's parents are informed of what they can and can't do up front. So anything is a mistake, it gets corrected. Mm -hmm. And for the bad actors, you have to pay back that money or you can be brought to charges until you do pay back that money. So contrast that sort of public accountability and scrutiny with, oh, wow, we just lost millions of dollars that we're never getting back under the other system. Well, we actually had something like that in West Virginia a few years ago. We had sort of a scandal where some of the school districts had received way more funding than what they were actually supposed to have been allotted underneath the funding formula. And then obviously conversely, some school districts received a lot less funding than what they were supposed to have received. But again, it's that, that, that funding formula is extremely difficult to manage. Um, and as you said, probably in West Virginia, there's about one and a half people that understand it, uh, how it's actually supposed to work here. So. There are a lot of myths, I think, out there around <laughs> school choice, right? And so, you know, we hear them all the time. So if you implement a private school choice program, the public schools will be hurt. They will have money drained from the system. Um, Rochelle, whenever you look at sort of a national landscape on this, do we see evidence that when there's a private school choice program that the public schools are damaged in a, in a financial sort of way? Absolutely not. It's quite the opposite. So. One thing we've done at IJ is, if we, is we've tried to look at some of these myths that surround private school choice programs and provide legislators and people across the country with the true reality. And the reality of that myth that you're talking about, Garrett, that private school choice programs harm public schools financially is simply a myth. There is no study to this date that has ever found that a private school choice program has had a negative fiscal impact on a public school. Wow. So, okay, that's very compelling then. So I, another one that we hear all the time then is, you know, if we have some sort of private school choice program, all the good students, quote, the good students will leave, right? And so, you know, you sort of damage the learning environment. And so the kids that are, quote, left behind in public schools will do worse, right? They don't have some, their peers there and whatever that argument actually looks like. So Vicki, do we have any evidence that when we have a private school choice program implemented, the public schools suffer academically? No. In fact, they're, again, it's the opposite. And the research, for example, 200 distinct scientific analyses from Columbia University Teachers College, not exactly fans of parental choice and education. Oh, I'm sure that's a right wing bastion. <laughs> <Columbia>. Yes, yes. <laughs> Those partisans. Um, but no. But they do. They do good, you know, great research actually. And what they found is that the overwhelming majority of the best research of those studies finds that competition from private school options improves public school outcomes across the board, specifically higher teacher pay, smaller class sizes, 
better efficiency without having to spend more. So all the things we hear about we're debating day in and day out, it helps solve that. And I'd like, I, I really want people to consider this. The situation right now in West Virginia and just a handful of states that still operate the way West Virginia does is this. You ration education based on where families can afford to live. And if that's not your first choice and you can't afford to move, and let's face it, moving is very expensive, you have a situation where it's not a, a, if it's not a school of choice, you don't get the benefits of parent buy-in, parent support, children who are not in it, just the right fit. I'm not saying this school is necessarily bad and this school is necessarily great. Is it a good fit for your child? And when you get that better fit, guess what happens? Children who are in a better fit are less disruptive in class. Mm -hmm. So the kids for whom it's a great fit are disrupted less and their learning is not, isn't compromised. Mm -hmm. Parents and teachers get along better. It's a win-win for everybody because one of the things we find is one of the benefits private schools have is that they are a chosen school and they get all the support that comes with that. Imagine if every school type, no matter what type you were, had that kind of support. I think everybody would be doing better. Children in one school, children in the other. Yeah, and that's really, I mean, we sort of apply that logic in almost every area of our lives, right? We, we expect flexibility, we expect personalization, we expect tailoring to our needs, right? Imagine if you went to the grocery store and you can only shop in one aisle, right? Like you get a little bit of what you needed, right? <laughs> But you wouldn't get everything that you needed. And I think that's sort of what we have right here in West Virginia. Again, one of the few states without any kind of choice. Um, so I want to wrap things up. Uh, again, we just want to have a 30,000 foot view of what school choice is and, and what it's not. But uh, Rochelle, I'll start with you. We'll just sort of wrap things up. If there's something that you could tell West Virginians watching this about school choice that we didn't, that we didn't get a chance to cover, and Vicki, I'll come to you with the same question. Uh, the floor is yours. Absolutely, thank you so much, Garrett. I think the most important thing is that there is no one size fits all approach to educating children. Vicki made such a wonderful point that work, what works for one child doesn't necessarily work for another. This is not a, an attack on public schools. I went to public school myself, but public school isn't necessarily the best fit for every child. And this is giving children the option to create an education that is best for them, that truly gives them what they need and gives them that opportunity to pursue their American dream, to go on to college, to pursue a job and truly thrive. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. Vicki, any kind of closing thoughts? I would say that I am so hopeful and really rooting for, for everyone in West Virginia, all West Virginia families, because don't get frustrated. Over 20 years ago, we were, you know, the bottom or near bottom of every ranking, spending, achievement, so forth. When we put parents in the driver's seat by putting every education option on the table for them, guess what? We have the highest uh, growth gains, achievement gains in the country, and it's not just the good students, it's among children who, sadly, we don't expect them to do well under the current system. So be hopeful, and you can achieve great things when you have the real experts in charge, and that would be children's parents. All right, awesome. Well, guys, we'll wrap that up. Um, again, thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the Cardinal Institute. Go to our Facebook page, uh, which obviously you're on right now if you're watching this. <laughs> Uh, go to our website, cardinalinstitute.com, and uh, feel free to send us an email. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. So thanks, everybody.